Hi there, I'm Christine Van Gein, and this is the Freedom Update, the new bi-weekly video podcast from the Canadian Constitution Foundation, where we talk about our ongoing cases, discuss interesting legal developments from across Canada, and talk about our upcoming events and how you can get involved. Thanks for tuning in, and let's talk about freedom. This week, we're working on a big case in British Columbia. We're asking the BC Court of Appeal to prevent the government from shutting down surgical and diagnostic clinics that have been doing vital work for patients in British Columbia for more than 20 years. The government wants to shut down these clinics using a law called the BC Medicare Protection Act. We challenged that law in court by arguing that it's a violation of our charter right to life, liberty, and security of person to force patients onto government wait lists that leave them waiting beyond maximum medically acceptable wait times, and then preventing them from seeking out alternative care. Patients have a right to choose how to care for their own health, including by accessing surgical clinics, privately run non-government surgical clinics that have existed in BC for more than 20 years. One of the patients in our case needed a colonoscopy, but the government system would have left her waiting well beyond medically acceptable wait times. Concerned about her health, she opted to pay for her own colonoscopy privately, and that's where she learned that she had stage four cancer. She was able to immediately start treatment and actually finished her treatment, which included two surgeries before her government colonoscopy was even scheduled. She was able to best protect her health and her own life because she had a choice. Another patient in our case, this one, a pediatric patient, was diagnosed at age eight with a degenerative spinal condition that caused a severe curve in his spine. Despite the fact that his condition was becoming progressively more severe, he waited 13 months for a government consultation. And then his family was told that the wait for actual surgery would be two years the Canadian system failed this patient. When he finally did get surgery, it was in the US and it was funded through private charity. But tragically, his condition had deteriorated so significantly through that extended wait that he was left paralyzed. There are many other patients like this, some who waited for treatment for nearly five years, patients who were left in pain, and other pediatric patients who were left languishing by a failed government system. The trial judge in that case found there was a violation of the right to security of person for patients with degenerative conditions who are put on government wait lists and denied an option to seek medical care outside the government system. That's what the BC Medicare Protection Act is designed to do. But the trial judge didn't strike down the law. Instead, he found that even though patients' rights were violated, the patients hadn't demonstrated that their suffering violated the principle of fundamental justice. In what world can it be fundamentally just to leave a child suffering in pain when there's another option? The government says the law exists to preserve the government healthcare system, but to force an individual to endure pain and even death in the aid of an efficient operation of a social program, it offends the basic principle of human dignity and equality. No one citizen can be treated as a mere instrument to improve the welfare of another. That's why we're asking for an injunction, a court order suspending the law until the case has been appealed. We're asking that while we continue to fight it out in court, patients still be allowed to choose how to access healthcare something that they've already been able to do for 20 years. We'll be sure to keep you updated through our video updates and through our mailing list, which you can subscribe to at www.theccf.ca. There's some interesting constitutional cases from across Canada. And this week, we're going to be checking in with Alberta, where there's an interesting legal development that's caught our attention. We noticed that Alberta has proposed changes to their civil forfeiture laws, and we have some concerns. Civil forfeiture allows provincial governments to seize assets when there's a suspicion of crime. Now, you might think that these laws only affect criminals, but the truth is that civil forfeiture allows the government to seize property, even from people who have never been charged with or even suspected of a crime. All the government has to show is that the property was used by someone, anyone, as an instrument of crime. 
These laws aren't fair, and we believe they're unconstitutional. That's why we've been involved in a number of cases involving civil forfeiture, and we wrote a report grading civil forfeiture laws across Canada. When we did our original report in 2016, we gave the province of Alberta a C grade. I mean, that sounds like it's not very good, but it was actually the highest grade in the country. But now we're gonna need to drop that grade because the province is amending those laws to make them worse. The proposed changes would expand the scope of civil forfeiture in Alberta and take away the court's ability to tailor individual restitution orders. The changes also give the government the power to recover the costs of forfeiture and restitution proceedings. These changes are, in Alberta are basically all about the money. And even the justice minister said the changes are about creating a new source of money. If civil forfeiture is really about deterring crime and taking assets away from criminals, there shouldn't be a focus on it as a revenue generating idea for the government. Civil forfeiture isn't supposed to be a cash grab, but unfortunately, that's how it's generally treated by most governments. Expanding the legislation's scope has the potential to create a government cash windfall. Civil forfeiture in Alberta used to be limited to criminal code and federal drug offenses, and offenses under the federal and Alberta laws. But with these changes, civil forfeiture can now apply to anything that is an offense in any province or territory, and even offenses committed in foreign countries. The Alberta government is attempting to enforce laws beyond its own borders and touting that, it will allow, that this will allow them to increase police funding. The link between seizing assets and police funding, and now the new provision that allows seized assets to fund the forfeiture program itself, creates a really dangerous incentive for police. The focus on police should be stopping and deterring crime, not raising revenue for themselves. Civil forfeiture is generally concerning because it is an end run around the criminal process. It has a lower standard than criminal proceedings, and you can lose money or property even if you're found not guilty of an offense. There have been many cases where innocent people have lost their property because they lent it to a, a delinquent relative. Imagine if you had loaned your car to your deadbeat brother who then used it to deliver drugs. Well, if that car is seized, it doesn't matter that it's yours. It's now a criminal asset and the state can come and take it. One part of Alberta Civil Forfeiture Act that actually made it less nefarious than similar legislation in other provinces was that the court had more discretion than other jurisdictions to craft what are called restitution payment orders. The ability of judges to craft proportionate civil forfeiture orders is one of the reasons that we gave Alberta a C grade in our report. But the proposed legislation repeals this provision of restitution assistance and removes the discretion. This is bad for proportionality and it's bad for justice. We have some upcoming events that are pretty exciting and we'll be, hope you can join us. There's an exciting new television network called the News Forum, and it's carried on Bell. It showcases opinions from Canada's center bright, something that ma the mainstream media is badly lacking in, in this country. I'll be appearing in some upcoming episodes of a program called Canadian Justice as a standing guest contributor. Check your Bell listings for episodes and reach out to me on Twitter for links to episodes. You can find me at C Van Gogh. We also have a really great event being planned by our friends at the Runnymede Society, a conversation with Supreme Court Justice Brown. The discussion will be around the separation of powers and it's gonna be taking place on November 18th at 1 p.m. Eastern. To register, visit runnymedesociety.ca and click on events. That's all for this update. Thanks for tuning in and let's keep fighting for freedom in Canada.